Okay, we are live. Whenever you are ready, President Mims. I'll call the meeting to order at six o'clock. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance. allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Next item on the agenda is approval or revision of the agenda for this evening. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? Thank you, Kelly. A second from Sherry. Any discussion? All those in favor of approving the agenda, please raise your hand, indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Next on the agenda, um, item 1.04 is a public hearing regarding additional days of in-person instruction. Do we have anyone for the public hearing for uh, regarding increased days, Sarah? We do not. Do any board members wish to speak? I have a presentation that I can run through very quickly okay. so that the board is up to speed. Right. Uh, as you can see, Sarah, can you? Yes, one moment, please. Thank you. As you know, and uh, I'll report at my uh, COVID update that we had a smooth start uh, to the new school year. In many ways, uh, this uh, reminisced for a lot of us, like the beginning of September. Uh, Mr. Furlong and I had a chance to meet with the bus drivers on Friday in eager anticipation, and uh, our Director of Transportation, John Cunningham, reminded all of them that there may be families that wish to take pictures and to treat this much like the first day of school, as a lot of remote students uh, we're back in the saddle again as the hybrid uh, cohorts came together for an in-person instruction. So on the first slide that you see there, uh, as you know, we had to put together a reopening plan um, that was due at the end of July based on information that was released by the New York State Department of Health and uh, the New York State Education Department. Next slide. That uh, was modified, as many of you know. Next slide and updated on April 9th, 2021. Uh, this is very important. It changed some things and it also uh, gave some contradictory information as compared to the Onondaga County Health Department policy proposal, which was released, as you know, on March 4th and then updated again on March uh, 16th as the county looked to purchase barriers as we moved forward. As far as the mandatory guidelines going forward, you can see that uh, they looked at social distancing, the gatherings, the number of students in the room. That's one of the reasons we went to the hybrid in terms of hygiene, cleaning, disinfection, communication, screening, and tracking. And one of the big changes, next slide, is the fact that we are moving from six feet to three feet, as you know, for instructional space and for things like music and physical education we are going from 12 foot to six foot. Next slide, please. So it asked, uh, as you know, back in July to put together our plan based on this reopening, monitoring and containment. Next slide. And under the, next slide, please. And then under the reopening uh, portion, it listed a number of uh, categories there. And I think one of the uh, important things to reference on the next slide, is that uh, masks are now mandatory. Uh, there was a lot of discussion early on about mask breaks, but now uh, the New York State Department of Health and the April 9th guidance is indicating that masks are now mandatory. Uh, it doesn't mean that we will not continue to provide mask breaks outside, but they no longer have to be provided in accordance with that guidance. In addition, they change things as you can see on transportation. As you know, we put one student per seat and now the last 15 minutes inbound and the first 15 minutes outbound, we are allowed to uh, put more than one student in a seat. We had been doing that with siblings from the same household, 
but Onondaga County has allowed us to do this. And then finally, under food services, six foot physical distance is required and we are able to do that at the secondary level. I know the board uh, exchanged some communications looking for guidance on this earlier last week. Uh, but as we know with the language that was adopted by the board uh, on April 5th, Onondaga County allows three feet with the barriers that they've purchased. Next slide. Uh, we will continue to monitor screen uh, testing protocols. I know the county is looking to host a vaccination clinic soon, and uh, but certainly testing will continue much like we've done the asymptomatic testing all along. Next slide. Containment will be very important. I know families are now responsible for temperature screenings at home as well as the uh, questionnaire before sending the children in. Uh, Dr. Diane Montgomery updated uh, for our families and reminded them that we are still following the COVID uh, protocols that parents, families should not send children into school that are exhibiting any of the symptoms of COVID, that the pandemic is very much out there and we still have to be vigilant going forward. Next slide, please. In closure and speaking uh, with our local county uh, health director, Dr. Gupta indicated that they will be paying uh, close attention to uh, the metrics. And uh, we may find ourselves, not just FM, but uh, Central New York in general, if there's an uptick in the virus, that they will uh, send us back to the hybrid uh, if there is a resurgence in the virus in spite of our best efforts. Next slide. The New York State Ed guidance was parallel, as you know, we had to provide 89 assurances to the Commissioner of Education. The Commissioner said that uh, she would defer to an executive order and changes by the New York State Department of Health. So we certainly uh, have that as of April 9th. It kind of leapfrogged uh, with the county guidance that came out in March. Next slide. So the components are the same. The plan has really not changed. And uh, as you can see from the state ed guidance on the final slide, next one, the state ed department is not reviewing or approving these revisions to the reopening plans. Local health departments are charged with, as you see, ensuring that the enforcement of the minimum standards are there. And we have been working closely, meeting sometimes weekly with our local Onondaga County Health Department officials. We certainly appreciate their efforts in providing the barriers, and we certainly will abide by that guidance, that policy proposal that was initially adopted by our Board of Education on April 5th. So I know a lot of families are excited to have the students back in, but uh, it's important to remember that everyone will be monitoring the situation. We'll still be sending out our notices in terms of positives, uh, the administration will be following any household contacts or quarantine information that we receive from both the New York State Department of Health in Albany and the Onondaga County Health Department. So uh, we are in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, we are going to remain vigilant, but I think there's so much here that uh, will benefit the students, but we will learn as a school district in terms of preparing for the new school year in September. So I know I speak on behalf of the organization. We're excited to have the students back. Uh, and I think there's uh, a lot of positive energy today, a little traffic congestion in some of our buildings, as you might expect, but a lot of positive energy with the return of the students. I'll entertain any questions that the board might have. I don't know, Sarah, did that did we get anybody? We have one person that is not familiar to me. I can admit her to the meeting if the board wishes to hear from Mrs. Wingard. One moment, please. Mrs. Wingard, are you with us? Mrs. Wingard? She says her audio is still connecting, so I think she's still trying to get her um, audio up. Mm -hmm.
That's apparently Daryl. That's Daryl. Daryl. <laughs> okay. All righty. Hey, Daryl. <laughs> okay. Um, I, did we have any? Did we have anyone else for public comment? We do not. Okay. All right. Any questions from the board for Dr. Tice in regards to his presentation? I, I do just have one question for clarification, Dr. Tice, and, and obviously what a great day for the students to be back on. I know that went great um, from everything I heard, but just can you just clarify what the current protocol is on what we hope doesn't happen, but we know will with quarantines, you know, it had gotten adjusted to where it was adjacent students and not whole classroom. So I know elementary is different because of the number of hours that are all in the classroom together, but at the higher levels, is it one ring of students around a positive? Or is it two rings of students now that they're four feet apart? Or how does that working currently? I will double check on that. But my understanding is now because of the larger groups and the three foot distance that uh, very similar to athletics, as I told the board before, we run the risk of having entire classrooms uh, taken offline and shuttered. Uh, for the quarantine period just because of the exposure radius. So uh, it will be something I, I can double check uh, with Dr. Montgomery as well as uh, the county, but I know they were modifying the guidance in terms of the uh, quarantines. And I know last week, the meeting with the chief school officers, we asked them for updated guidance because all the school districts are facing that now with the three foot distance as opposed to six. So that's a great question. But it, it, it just seems odd that it would yeah. expand wider, a wider perimeter than it was. It, it's going to expand a wider perimeter and it's going to be very similar like what I said before that our interscholastic athletic teams in the event of a positive case, uh, as the board knows, we've lost an entire uh, team in quarantine uh, for the requisite period because of that, just because of the time they're spending together. So we may very well see that again. Uh, some of you know with the data dashboard, uh, the COVID dashboard that I have to report to on a daily basis, that's one of the questions is whether we're shuttering a school, uh, the district, or a classroom. So they do ask for that specificity. And then just when you do get that clarification, I know it only affects really one grade of our school, but, but am I correct that students with full vaccination would not have to be quarantined? I believe so, if they're out the 14 days beyond that. Okay. Thanks. I am not a medical professional, nor did I stay at a, the requisite hotel last night. So I will confer with our COVID medical director, Dr. Montgomery. Thank you. Any additional questions for Dr. Tice? I just want to say thank you to, to you and the administration and all of our staff for getting us to this point. And it is truly a wonderful day for our, for our kids. So thank you. You're here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. For doing that. Yes. Uh, the smiles on their faces today were, were well worth it. Yeah. A lot of hard work went into that. Thank you all Absolutely. so much. Yep. Um, okay, item 1.05, public comment. Sarah, do we have anyone for public comment? Uh, we do not right now. I am expecting someone who has not yet joined. Okay, um, well, if they join, we will certainly accommodate them. Thank you. All right, but for now, we'll move on to item 2.01, the capital project presentation. Dr. Tice? Certainly, we have a couple of slide decks here. I'll ask Sarah to load the, the first one, which is yours truly, on behalf of the Facilities Committee, chaired by uh, Mr. Seidberg. Uh, we have been meeting uh, uh, for a little bit of time uh, this year. Uh, during COVID, uh, we've been busy uh, preparing for what possibly could be another referendum that we would like to put before the voters uh, later this year. Uh, things have not been finalized. They're certainly in the conceptual design stage. The administration has been involved. We certainly are gonna need more time to flush out the details as we involve the, the faculty and the staff and, and things uh, move from 
more of a conceptual design that you will hear about tonight to the actual schematic design and then the design development phase where we're actually starting to build the bid documents that will go uh, in front of uh, the contractors. So here's an update. Now, if this slide looks familiar to you, uh, it was done on purpose. It's vintage. It should take a lot of you back to uh, when we had a community task force uh, looking at what to do with the Wellwood project. And this was intentional on my part. Uh, some of you were not even on the board at the time. You were sitting in the audience asking a lot of tough questions at the time as we wrestled with the Wellwood project. But I did wanna take you down a trip of memory lane, which I think will set the stage in the context, which I know the facilities committee thought was very important before we turned it over to the architects and Dr. Kilmer and construction manager for comments about some of the conceptual ideas that were, were kicking around at this point. And again, this is the 30,000 foot view. Uh, I do not want anybody to leave tonight's presentation and, and think that everything has been decided because by any stretch of the imagination, it hasn't been. Uh, we need to start uh, putting this together. We did not want to linger and wait any longer. We wanted to share this with the board now in April. It is our intent to come back, uh, as you will hear later in the presentation, in May with a possible phasing plan from our construction management firm. And then at the same time in June, maybe we'll be able to assign some values to it and estimates. So we're not really prepared to do that tonight. Certainly everybody wants to know when and uh, how much, uh, but some of those questions will unfold as this presentation gives way to May and June and as we move forward uh, towards the fall. So Sarah, I'll ask you for the next slide. You may recall that we hired a consulting firm to try to look into the criteria because uh, no matter what construction and what changes to a physical plant we do as a district, it certainly affects our staff, the students, the instructional programming. So it was important to take a look at a variety of criteria. And we, our, our consultant firm had focus groups, they did surveys, they interviewed a lot of people in all of our buildings, administrators, teachers, coaches, and so forth. And next slide, you can see uh, that they identified uh, a variety of criteria. Uh, Sarah, if you'd like to toggle through those the currency and quality of the program, safety, security, efficiency of day-to-day -day operations, the extent that the facilities are energy efficient, uh, maintaining a low property tax burden for our taxpayers, uh, the stability of the students and not uh, having them change uh, multiple times uh, between buildings to keep it pretty uh, uniform and the priority, as you can see, for the stakeholders, what would be the consensus of the team? Next. And out of that, uh, through those focus groups, through those surveys, through those interviews with the Board of Education, uh, three of these criteria area, and this benefits our new construction management firm, were identified by uh, the Board of Education, the three top three being mission critical. The first is the currency and quality of the district's instructional program. Simply put, we felt that the instructional program, the facilities committee felt, the board at the time felt that the instructional program should drive the decisions about bricks and mortar. And that was very important. The tail should not wag the dog. It was very, uh, uh, I think, mission critical for us that we would build the spaces that uh, our teachers and students needed. Next. The next one is safety and security. And as you might expect, a sign of the times and the tragedies that have occurred throughout the nation, safety and security was very much on the forefront of everybody's mind in term, minds in terms of single points of entry and uh, being vigilant in terms of cameras and so forth. And then finally, the third and final one is uh, given our district and the tax burden and because that uh, you know, in the day-to-day -day budget operations that foundation aid, uh, the responsibility had been shifted to the local taxpayer. Uh, it was very important for the board at the time at Wellwood and uh, through the focus groups that it was uh, addressing the needs, not so much the wants, but bear, bearing, being very mindful of the tax burden that already is on the taxpayers 
looking for things like retiring debt service and ways to maximize the benefit uh, for the, the taxpayers at the least tax impact. Next slide. So as a result of that, they did a trip down memory lane and taking a look at some past capital projects. Sarah, if you'll toggle them all up. At the time, back in 2017, uh, they kind of looked in the rear view mirror and you can see that there was work to Wellwood and Fayel and the bus, new bus garage, transportation center, Mott Road. Projects were approved for roof replacement as was Fayel. And so a lot of good things were done in terms of uh, the building condition survey, which took place in 2015 uh, with uh, King and King as our architects and Tetra Tech also uh, completing a building condition survey. Next. Since that time, uh, we've done a lot of additional work too. In 2016, the Eagle Hill roof replacement Enders Road roof channel, 10-year roof replacement, additional site work and asbestos management. 17 Mott Road elementary windows, phase one uh, took place. Uh, FM High School auditorium lighting and sound upgrades and Fayetteville Elementary main office, single point of entry improvements. In 2018, Mott Road elementary windows in phase two. 19, the high school stadium lighting as part of the EPC project, large group instruction room, which was part of a SAMS grant, uh, thanks to Assemblyman Al Sturpey's uh, support. 19, also the high school security upgrades, Mott Road fire alarm replacement, uh, high school emergency project on the retaining wall near the house two main entrance. In 2020, Enders Road, a new classroom addition. We did a ribbon cutting there, which included STEM maker space and a reading room, and as well as, uh, I think, a uh, high school library media center that rivals most college campuses. And uh, in addition, a lot of uh, student restroom renovations and upgrades. Uh, we certainly listened to the students and uh, wanted the creature comforts uh, fixed up and I think they were pleased to find out that we listened to what they had to say. In 2020, Wellwood uh, new addition was under construction, moving services out of the basement. We wanted it to be ADA accessible. The Fayetteville Elementary School, as you know, we did uh, an independent electrical service, which was very important uh, to be able to cut the umbilical between uh, Fayel and Wellwood. We also looked at uh, bathroom renovations and security measures at Fayel. And then finally, in the current year, renovations are continuing at Wellwood uh, after the new addition. We're moving into the 1933 building and looking forward to capital transfer projects such as the paving of Pride Lane and new speed bumps, something that was identified by this very Board of Education in terms of the disrepair that Pride Lane was under additional high school security work, asbestos abatement, and uh, replacement of the carpeting uh, with tile floors at Enders Road Elementary as we've uh, dealt with some issues over there in terms of the humidity at uh, Enders Road. Next slide. So really tying this all in together with the work that had been done and being able to look in the rear view mirror, the building condition survey identified a number of issues that we had to address. And at the time, the Board of Education back then prioritized uh, the buildings that they felt were uh, in the most need of repair. Next slide. And that was Wellwood Middle School. That's why we're addressing it uh, right now. Next in the batting order was FM High School. In fact, the boilers there are in similar vintage uh, at Wellwood. And uh, the Wellwood boilers, as we know, were, were in need of replacement in terms of the, with high efficiency boilers. Enders Road was batting third in terms of the priority area. And then last but not least, Eagle Hill Middle School. Uh, and this, a lot of this, as you saw from the earlier slides, a lot of work had been done already at Mott Road and Fayel. So it was a matter of attending to the other four buildings of the district. Uh, and this was the rank order that took place. So the final slide, I believe, shows them in order, Wellwood High School, Enders Road and Eagle Hill. And that's sort of how we got there. We didn't pick it out of a hat. High school was next in line. We've been very methodical and systematic about this. So with Wellwood uh, under construction at this time in terms of dealing with the building condition survey, and the work of, and the, of the infrastructure that needs to be attended to, as well as uh, programmatic upgrades, 
high school is the next in the order. So at this time, I will turn it over to our lead architect and her slide deck, which I think she will operate to take us through some of the conversations that Dr. Kilmer and the facilities committee team have been pondering of late. Hello, everybody. Um, I think most of you remember me, but my name is Erica Civitella. I work with King & King Architects. I am the project manager um, working on this exciting project. So. First of all, we're very fortunate to be working on this. I think much like Wellwood, um, the high school has, will have a big impact on the community and the students. So we're really fortunate to be working on this project. Um, and as a fellow parent, I'm excited to see my kids go through um, these changes at the school as well and see the impact on them. Now, um, we have been working very closely over the past few months with the administration. Uh, the facilities committee, as well as uh, Mr. Ray Kilmer, the principal at the high school, to really understand and evaluate not only the, the infrastructure needs and the facility needs defined by the VCS, as well as the educational goals um, that we're looking to implement at the high school. So, oh, technical. So right now we are in the process of looking at the high school holistically. And um, I'd like to turn it over to our fellow high school principal to talk about how we establish some of these goals and some of the challenges and things that we've been working with at the high school. Thank you, Erica. Um, Erica, if you would actually go back a slide for me and put the picture of the high school back together. Uh, since I arrived here as a teacher back in 2000, um, there are common threads or themes that you hear from the faculty and staff of Fayetteville Manlius High School. And one um, theme that has come over and over again is how disconnected the building feels. Um, house two, which is to your top left, it is closest to 173 was actually built as the original high school and occupied in September of 1962. Uh, and that building alone housed a thousand or was supposed to uh, hold a thousand students. Um, the house one building that we talk about now was actually a junior high school and was actually occupied in 1965. And when Eagle Hill was built and occupied in 1972, the two buildings were connected uh, with a back hallway. For those of you that are FM true residents, you, you have stories of the back hallway, um, good or bad, and then the underpass and overpass. And so what you have is, is you have a very uniquely designed building. In fact, it was never designed to be a single building. They were built as two completely separate entities and they were ultimately connected. Um, and while we have found great ways to bring that community together, there has always been a great desire to find a way to really unify and try to find a way to truly connect um, the high school for the betterment of all of its staff and, of course, for its students. Let me go back to the next slide, Erica. So when we had conversations as a high school facilities committee last winter and the beginning of last March before we had to close, um, the key aspects of course were on, on infrastructure. HVAC was something that came up over and over again. Heating and ventilation throughout the high school has been a, a topic of uh, discussion for many, many years. Um, many more so I think in the house two side since house two has no air conditioning whatsoever. So as you can imagine, there's a little bit more focus there but the HVAC systems as a whole. However, the, what's always been most important to our teachers and really for our students is the educational programming that we're able to provide and how the facility uh, facilitates that. And, and through these conversations, um, also with the conversation about change of start time, the possibility of making adjustments to the high school schedule, one common factor um, that came up over and over again was the fact that we have a cafeteria that can only feed approximately 200 students um, at a time. Uh, we have an eight period day. 
I would need uh, seven periods to feed all 1400 students. So we would have to start serving lunch uh, at 8.30 and then we would get done approximately a time when we would dismiss students. And, and clearly that's not practical. But part of that also is, is that we don't have that central hub. And, and that was something we were really looking for is how can we connect those two buildings together while also uh, addressing some of those other needs that could also provide additional versatility instructionally, not just as a cafeteria, but finding other opportunities for our extracurricular programs, our educational programs uh, to meet and collaborate together. And that would also improve our social environment, um, that kind of collaborative piece. Another big piece that's always been a concern here is the fact that students actually have to traverse outside um, when they pass. Our hallways that connect the two buildings are not large enough to accommodate all of our students passing from one house to the other. And so our students, uh, while it's only about 40 feet, they're uh, traveling, they are traveling outside. And that provides a, a unique security issue for us. Um, and so that's always been a piece for us to try to look at, to find a better way to connect the facility, to make it easier, and then of course, more accessible. And with that, I'll turn it over to Erica to talk a little bit more about the infrastructure. So as you guys know, there is um, some very old equipment and building systems in the high school. That was the driving force of the initial conversations. We knew that most of the building systems, especially in house two, the HVAC systems were in need of replacement. Um, the boilers were of similar vintage of Wellwood. And although Wellwood had a higher need at the time, the high schools were right there, right behind it. Um, so big part of the project is addressing the infrastructure needs. A goal that we've been looking at is how can we because this is gonna consume so much of the project, how can we make the programmatic aspect of it align with the infrastructure needs? So that has been a big part of our discussion is talking with everybody to figure out what the, what the driving elements are for program and how we can make that work and, and upgrade those areas and while also addressing all the infrastructure. So a big part of our conversation now, especially living in the COVID world that we do has been indoor air quality and ventilation. So that is something we also look to upgrade and improve at the school um, with basically all those system replacements. Also energy efficiency. This is always part of our conversation is how can we improve the energy efficiency of the building and minimize the footprint, right? So um, with, with mass, with replacing large portions of the building and separate systems, we have an opportunity to come in and put in energy efficient systems that will improve this for the future. We're also looking at site improvements throughout the, throughout the site. Um, this is still yet to be further defined, but we really wanna look at addressing deteriorated site elements and evaluating the functionality of the site, okay? So we have been working on some conceptual plans. I just wanna reiterate that we have spent a lot of time working through various options to date. These are in no way final and they will change and they will develop as um, more information comes to us and more meetings continue. So um, they are conceptual and preliminary, but I also think they're really exciting um, snapshot of time of what we're looking at for the school. So what you're looking at here is a floor plan of um, the high school. Can you guys see my cursor? Okay, so this part is house two. This is house one. This is the art wing and the auditorium, just to orient yourselves. Um, this is the main entrance of the school. So everything identified in the different gray shades and green are basically the architectural elements that we're looking at upgrading as part of the project. Um, as Ray had mentioned, one of the challenges of the school is the undersized cafeteria, as well as that connection between house one and house two. Um, so we've looked at that as an opportunity right here in the middle. You can see we're looking at a two-story cafeteria expansion so that it's not only an expansion of the cafeteria upstairs, but it also is, is part of the downstairs, a first floor, and used as the connecting, connecting element between the two sides of the school. We are also looking at a new elevator and centralized staircase. 
um, right when you walk into the building so that it's more easily navigated um, and your wayfinding ability through the school is much improved. Um, as another challenge that um, the school has worked has is working through right now is disconnected main offices. So there is a house two main office, there's a house one main office, a separate nurse office and a counseling office. So what we're looking at as part of this project is consolidating the house two office and house main office and nurse and student services in one centralized location, which is more easily available off the front entrance of the building. So you don't have parents or people traversing throughout the school to find these um, spaces. So these items here noted in green are some of the programmatic elements that we are looking at upgrading at the school. The technology addition. This area in green is indicating a addition going on to the science area of house two, creating almost like a STEM wing, STEM side of the building so that technology is um, located with those other program areas. We're also looking at expanding the learning support center. This is a space that's currently upstairs adjacent to the cafeteria. Um, we are looking at putting that on the first floor, enlarging it and having it off the main entrance and connected to the first floor um, food service area. The auxiliary gymna gymnasium will also be upgraded as well as the wellness center, the photography lab, um, student services, will be um, located within the counseling suite, I'm sorry, the main office consolidation area. We are also looking at complete updating of all of the house two um, classrooms with finishes and casework, as well as updates in the existing counseling suite. So now moving upstairs, maybe. Okay, here we go. So now we're looking at the second floor. Um, you can see this area here is the footprint of your existing cafeteria. We are looking at expanding out this way towards house one, um, almost more or less more than doubling the size of the cafeteria so that we can house um, as many students as we can in that space. We're also looking at locating broadcast journalism that space is currently located in the basin, basement and it is um, very undersized and it, this is an amazing opportunity to create a larger space for them centrally located in the school. You can see these green areas here, green spaces here are um, three potential new program spaces looking, looking at them in the science area. And I think that is most of it, but you can see here the old bridge used to connect like this, and now we're looking at a direct connection between house one and house two with that elevator and grand stand staircase in the middle. So infrastructure, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing upgrades. Um, I think this slide is helpful because what we did is some part of each of these spaces identified in gray is being upgraded as part of the infrastructure upgrades. So you can see, it addresses most of the building. Um, this area here was already previously addressed as part of the media center project. So you can see that's the, that's the only white area significantly left and how much of the building is really gonna become more energy efficient, improved indoor air quality and HVAC systems. So just to touch on some of those systems we're looking at replacing, we're looking at the house two HVAC replacement, house one air handling unit replacement, electrical panel uh, replacement building wide, house two boiler replacement. We did the house one on a previous project. Um, lighting replacement with LED. So any of the spaces that we do renovate and get into, all the lights will be upgraded to LED. We're looking at ventilation system upgrades throughout as well as rooftop unit replacement, um, selectively the ones that are at the end of their serviceable life. So we've done a fair amount of planning to date, but there's still quite a bit left to do. So we wanted to just highlight some of these um, moments in time that we have to do next to get us towards a vote date. So here we are in April 
Um, we have put together quite a few programming meetings, performed site investigations, and developed preliminary conceptual plans. That is what I wanted to present to you all today, so you can see where we are in the process. In May, um, our construction management team and the architectural team will be working with the facilities committee um, and the administration on developing the phasing and logistics plans. There, as you can see, a project of this size and magnitude, there is quite a lot to figure out um, to make sure that it can function with the students in the building. In June, we plan to have the budget and financials, project financials um, planned out. So we hope to come back in that time frame and present to you guys an update of where we are with the estimate and the financials and tax impact. In July, we're looking to submit the preliminary SED submission. Um, so there's quite a few things that we have to do as part of this, as well as the district, like a facility needs assessment, evaluating the um, special education programs in the building. And that is when it will go to SED and they will potentially look at um, aidability for the project. In August, September timeframe, um, you guys will look at accepting seeker and adopt a voter referendum. All of this leading up to a potential vote date sometime between October and December. That is really to be determined. What we did was we put together a schedule, an aggressive schedule to work towards an October date. And if anything really slips, we know that we can work, we can still make it work as late as December. And that is everything that I have. I don't know if um, Bill wanted to touch base on anything else. Yeah, I think the only thing I would like to add is, uh, you know, related to the uh, financial impact, uh, the construction management firm, which Chase is still working on our cost estimates. And uh, as Erica had mentioned, we plan on having that information in a month or so. Uh, please know that we are uh, looking to try and maximize um, the building aid that New York State would pay to the FM school district. Uh, our building aid ratio continues to um, increase. Uh, this next year, we're up to 80.3%, meaning that for every dollar we spend that's aidable, we get 80 cents on the dollar back from New York State, including principal and interest, if uh, in this case, because we would have to borrow the money. Uh, we're also looking at trying to match up the, um, the new uh, debt coming on stream from this project to coincide with debt that will be retired in the 23, 24 and 24, 25 school years. So we're looking at trying to minimize the tax impact by uh, taking advantage of the debt that will be falling off in those two school years. Thank you, Mr. Furlong. As the last slide indicated, uh, we can open it up to questions from the board or the facilities committee. Is anybody from the facilities committee would like to weigh in before we open up to, for questions? I just to interject for a second, there's a couple of people on this that I think are new to the full board that have been in facilities. So Bob Marquetta and Laird Updike are from La Chase, our new construction management firm. I don't know if you guys want to just take a quick moment and introduce yourselves because we haven't been with the full board yet, if you would, Bob. Uh, yeah, Robert Marquetta, I'm the, the uh, project manager on the uh, on the project. And like you said, we're working through the estimate right now, working with uh, King & King just uh, reconcile and everything, and we should have hopefully some good information shortly. Good evening, I'm Laird Updike. I'm a project executive with the Chase on the project. I apologize, I'm driving my daughter home from a volleyball game right now uh, in the Syracuse area. Um, but uh, we look forward to working with the project team and um, working to uh, identify the project schedule and phasing and make sure the estimates the project works with the uh, the intended budget the district collects. Thanks, guys. Just wanted to make sure everybody had a chance to know who, know who else was on the screen here. So thank you. Uh, 
Well, the facilities the team has certainly been very busy with this project. Is there any comment from any other member of the facilities committee about the work that you all have put into this? No? It's tremendous. I mean, this is, wow, very impressive. <laughs> I, the, the program that we'll be able to do with our students and the safety issues this is going to address are really tremendous. So I applaud the committee and um, the administrators who are working on this. Where's Ray? Did he leave? Try, oh, there he is. <laughs> Find my square. There's a lot of squares tonight. Okay. I think it's very exciting. I, I loved hearing it all again tonight. So thank you, Dr. Tyson, Bill, and Carica. Where did Erica go? Oh, there she is. Being this, this is all new to me. I'm not being on the facilities committee. This is really exciting. And it looks like it'll really bring the high school together in a way that it hasn't been in the past. Yeah, I guess I just one question. Uh, so I know tonight we talked about the timeline and the timeline kind of takes us to the boat. Let's say we're successful in the boat in December. I guess, when do we get shovels in the ground and what is the length of the project that we anticipate? That, uh, Jason, will probably be flushed out and we can share that with the entire board there. Depending on where we land, uh, we'll determine the length of the project and how much we try to, to tackle. Uh, but just to go to your initial question, if we vote later on this year and other members can jump in here to correct me, if we vote this year, we're still going to have to take time, as we said, to go through uh, schematic design, design development, uh, the bid documents uh, to submit the state ed facilities planning for approval. Once we get the approval, we can go out for bid. Hopefully it would be uh, in the winter of 22, uh, 23, uh, hopefully at that time frame, which means uh, we would award bids sometime early 2023 and shovels in the ground uh, in the late spring, summer of 2023. Okay. I see a right. lot of nodding, so I don't think I butchered that answer, but it's just. Uh, <laughs> you know, just to bring it to time as yeah, well. Yeah, just, just to bring around, you know, one of the exciting parts about this project, I think that everybody in the district will come to see is, is this is obviously the building through which every student in this district passes. So th this is truly a project that's going to impact every single student that's coming through this district in a, in a positive way. And, improving a lot of the programmatic opportunities that they have. And, and just to your question, Jason, on timing, uh, obviously this has been an extraordinarily busy year for our faculty and administrators. Oh, and, and just a little bit. So, you know, Ray, Ray, Dr. Kilmer's obviously got a lot of meetings to, to, to be held within the high school still to go through. And, and that's part of the whole process of pulling details together. And that's, that's still to come. So this is a preview, it's an overview, but there's, there's a whole lot more exciting to be coming over the next few months. Great. And to piggyback on that, and again, just to show you we're at the conceptual stage, that tech wing looks very intriguing, as some of you have said, Sherry indicated, you know, a STEM wing there with math and science and tech together. But specifically, are, do the tech rooms, should they be separate? Should they connect? How should we design the hallway? There's just so much that still needs to be flushed out. You know, are they better served uh, to be able to connect or to keep them separate? So. There are just a lot of conversations, and I know, I know that's just a silly little example, but we still have to flush the details out. Right now, we're taking a look at square footage and trying to assign values to that just to give us a ballpark figure, and hopefully we'll have that for you in June. Awesome. Great work, guys. Will the cafeteria be, I mean, it sounds like it will be a really wonderful place to collaborate beyond being. Is that the intended idea that it will just be a gathering space for students that have otherwise had to meet in the hallway or other spots. I'll let Ray jump in here, but that's the idea as he indicated, the central knuckle of the building, but also multi-purpose is one of the right. things we've talked about. Dr. Kilmer, do you wanna embellish on that? Yeah, I, honestly, I, from here on out, I'd like to not call it the cafeteria. No. Um, only because the cafeteria has a, a singular purpose. And that's not what this is. Um, while students will eat here, it will not be its primary purpose. Its primary purpose is to serve the instructional program and extracurricular program of Fayetteville Manly's High School. So whether it's breakout rooms, whether it's additional collaborative space, um, it, this will have 
uh, incredible functional space for, for all of our programming and hopefully will be used from the start of the school day well into the evening hours uh, and not just as a place where students eat. That's, yeah, that's, I, I hear you and that's wonderful. And I would think that along with the new library media center, of just creating really wonderful spaces for our students to, to connect and learn together, so. And that being said, uh, Dr. Kilmer's work and the facilities committee and the architects, for example, by making it multi-level and multi-purpose, there could be a learning stair in there that could accommodate guest, guest speakers after hours by getting it down to the lower level uh, Dr. Kilmer could open up that courtyard area. It would be a safe and contained courtyard uh, that would uh, have, could have some tables to allow students to eat outside, something that uh, is currently precluded given the current uh, state of the facility. So I think there's been a great banter back and forth uh, between Dr. Kilmer, the architects, the facilities committee, and coming up, like I said, not only a multi-purpose room, but also one that's going to open new possibilities such as that center courtyard um, to be able to be used as an open air space. Thank you. My other question, which kind of goes beyond the scope of this project is are there, are there any big needs left for the high school that will not be addressed in this project? I mean, kind of what to expect beyond that. And if that's too big a question, we can discuss it at a later date. I'm just curious as we move on from there, you know, what's next? I know we have identified other buildings in order of priority. Yeah, there, I mean, as with anything, this is, is ongoing. Uh, even with Wellwood, as we know, we've tackled the lion's share, but we're still going to have to come back. Uh, part of the juggling or things like state ed refers to as maximum cost allowances that reset every five years. So there's no shame in doing what we did at Wellwood to try to maximize the benefit for the taxpayers and reduce costs by coming back to something later. So this certainly will tackle quite a bit at the high school, but it will not be everything. There will be some things that we will have to come back to. In fact, our next building condition survey, as you know, was supposed to be done on five-year intervals. The last one was 2015. So for those finger counting, you would think it would be 2020. Ours, as you know, they staggered it to help stay that. Ours will not take place until 2023. So there may even still be things identified with the new building condition survey in 2023 that uh, serve as a tickler for us to come back to the high school at a later date. But certainly given the goals that Dr. Kilmer outlined, this tackles quite a bit, just like we did at Wellwood. I just want to give my kudos to the whole OACM team and the administration because not only is this, I know, preliminary conceptual design, <laughs> not only is it very creative and um, I know would be great for the students in whatever you know iteration it becomes, but I, I feel like there's been a, a, a real um, importance set on trying to make sure that we are keeping the cost to a place where it's manageable. So the, to come up with something so cost effective and so creative is just really impressive. So I think everybody who's been involved. Great job all around. Thank you all very much. And thank you, Erica and Laird. I don't want to mispronounce it, Laird. And Robert for joining us. And did I miss anyone? Oh, where is where is he at? There he is, Jason. Benedict, how are you? Nice to see you. Thank is you all any, for coming this evening. Anything else Jason or Robert or Laird would like to say that we forgot? Nope. I'm good. Erica covered it very well. Yeah, I, I would, hear you guys did a great job. Thank you. Yeah, I would only echo uh, Erica's initial comments that it's a pleasure for us to be able to continue our working relationship with the district, you know, all the things that are going on great with Wellwood. Hopefully we carry that on as a team uh, through the high school. And so it's a lot of great things going on. So we appreciate the opportunity. Well, thank you very much, Jason. Thank you to all of you. And thank you to the facilities committee. Great job, everybody. This is very exciting. All right. Next on the agenda, item 2.02, 
the 2021-22 proposed full budget presentation. Uh, President, Mr. Mitt. President oh, so wait, Mitt. I'm sorry. Thank you. You did text me. I'm sorry. We're going to, before we do that, we're going to circle back to public comment because the person who wanted to speak is here. I'm sorry. Thank, Thank you. you. One moment, please. Okay. Good evening, Denise. You are live with the Board of Education. You're welcome to read your statement. Good evening to all. I am here in my official capacity as the fourth vice president of the FMTA. Mary Petrullis was not able to be on at this time. She was on earlier when we couldn't get in. And so I would like to read a statement from the FMTA. Uh, it was deemed very important that this statement be read uh, at the uh, Board of Education meeting. And uh, I can also provide to Sarah the text of the statement if she would like that. We members of the Fayetteville Manliest Teachers Association are heartbroken and outraged over acts of violence against Asian people. We recognize that violence against Asian American communities is part of a larger system of violence and racism against all communities of color, including black, Hispanic, indigenous and immigrant communities. The increase in anti-Asian racism and discrimination hurts students, families, and communities across the country. Our hearts are heavy as we are reminded once again of the persistence of racism and inequality that exists in the United States. We understand that these recent tragedies affect the emotional and mental welfare of all of our students and their families. We would like the entire community especially our Asian community members, to know that we stand with you and are here for you. In times of grief and unrest, we want to reaffirm that we are a community. We must dedicate ourselves to ensuring a safe place for students to learn and feel valued. We are committed to helping our students give voice to their grief and to use our tools as educators to empower them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Denise. Thank you very much, FMTA, Executive Council, and Mary Petrullis as um, president and all of our teachers for that statement of support for our Asian American <clears throat> students. Um, that was, thank you. Thank you so much. We have some really special people in this district, I tell you. Um, okay. Um, item 2.02, .02, the proposed full budget presentation. Mr. Furlong. Yes, good evening, everyone. Uh, let me share the screen with you. Can everybody see the presentation okay? Yes. So, um, you know, this presentation has is, is kind of changed. Mm -hmm. Uh, once we received the New York State uh, budget uh, and what that meant for the Fayetteville Manlius School District in terms of state aid, uh, we basically had to go back and rework uh, the budget. While last year we had to rework it um, in terms of trying to reduce the budget, uh, this year because we received a significant increase in foundation aid, we looked at actually increasing the budget. So. This has changed and I will try and highlight those changes uh, since we last looked at the budget in detail uh, at the uh, third uh, budget workshop that the board uh, saw about a month ago. So Dr. Tice, would you like to take uh, the next few slides? I certainly can, if you would. Uh, you can see that wonderful picture of uh, our library media center. This next slide uh, certainly shows a number of our uh, student uh, instrumental uh, artists uh, performing. Uh, we did quite a few of those last year uh, during uh, the pandemic and this year as well. And it just brings everybody together in a way uh, virtually that we hope to be able to replicate going forward. And as you can see from the slide, our mission statement uh, is still uh, NFM, and it's been our foundation for a long time, a commitment to that academic excellence. Uh, we want our students to excel uh, with innovative programs and aspire uh, to wonderful things. And uh, when we redid our vision and mission statement, 
we embedded four key priority areas. And those priority areas, as you can see there, teaching and learning, positive school environment, supportive community partnerships, and fiscal capacity and responsibility. And the fourth one is of particular interest here is it's a very important task of the Board of Ed to develop the spending plan uh, each and every year. And those guiding principles that have been part of our fiscal capacity and responsibility, as you can see there, is financial stewardship, sustainability, sound budgeting, and best business practices. And I know our business office has worked very hard in embracing these. We've seen it in uh, comptroller report audits. We've seen it in our regular external and internal uh, audits that take place every year with our audit committee. We've really committed uh, to uh, the frugal nature of the community and working hard because we value the dollar, but we also want to provide uh, the most for our children uh, given uh, for what we spend uh, each and every year. Next slide, please, sir. Our accomplishments are many. Under teaching and learning, as you can see, uh, we've done a weekly staff development this year uh, in terms of online learning. Uh, when life gives you lemons, such as the pandemic, you make lemonade. And I'm pleased to say that Dr. Mary Coughlin, who's on the call tonight and uh, have, has worked with her teacher leaders and staff developers, our curriculum resource teachers and instru instructional technology specialists. Uh, and uh, Dr. Coughlin and Marcus have done uh, weekly staff development uh, to help the teachers with new software, new applications, uh, techniques uh, for both synchronous and asynchronous instruction. In the area of positive school environment, uh, we've worked for mental health supports, therapy dogs, mindfulness, second step. Uh, the parent night on student mental health recently took place with the uh, HSA and Enders Road. Our homeschool liaisons have been uh, doing double duty this year, trying to connect with both in-person students and remote students and to keep them uh, connected. And also behind the scenes, the facilities committee should take credit uh, too for safety and security projects. While we won't delve into specific details because they are supposed to be kept confidential, I can assure you that uh, the work of our district community task force has been taken to heart and a lot of projects, especially in transfer to capital have focused on safety and security measures in all our buildings. Under supportive community partnerships, we continue our networking and legislative advocacy, as it says there. We have been participating with our tri-state consortium partners uh, through virtual meetings, study groups, uh, trying to see how all of us are navigating the pandemic. And our partnerships with the American Association of School Administrators, whether it's the Future, Future Focus Schools Collaborative, the Personalized Learning Cohort, has taken a look at a lot of DEI issues that we will now have to deal with. As the board knows, last uh, Monday, a week ago today, our Board of Regents out of Albany has adopted a DEI initiative. More information will be forthcoming in terms of policy and uh, regulations. And certainly our partnership with AASA has uh, helped us to see what is happening on the national, national stage for school districts as well. And part of that partnership is with the Onondaga County Health Department. They have been very gracious, as I indicated earlier, in providing the barriers uh, for uh, the district. They have provided testing, not only for our student athletes, but for asymptomatic testing in all of our buildings. They've been there and have been very helpful. And I know they're working towards uh, a vaccination clinic. In fact, the county executive, Ryan McMahon, and today's press briefing indicated that it's uh, his intent to try to get to all school districts within the next few weeks uh, in terms of vaccination clinics. And then last but not least, uh, fiscal responsibility and capacity, long range uh, fiscal plan. I know our financial uh, committee, finance committee has talked about that uh, through numerous budget workshops that have involved the whole board an RFP cycle for professional services, uh, capitalism and competition is good. In fact, it isn't just a sound business practice. We were recently recognized by the Office of the State Comptroller who audited our RFP uh, 
cycle to make sure that we were uh, doing right by the taxpayers. Uh, train, uh, transparency and financial reporting is required by the state and certainly the financial oversight on building projects, working with our two construction management firms to review change orders and certainly field conditions. And I'm pleased to say as the finance committee would tell you is that Wellwood's progressing ahead of schedule and under budget. So things that we should be very proud of in terms of uh, watching the purse strings here in Fayetteville Manlius. Mr. Furlong, I'll turn it back over to you, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> so the general overview of the budget that we're gonna be reviewing the, tonight is uh, first and foremost, that we are budgeting based upon the premise that we will be uh, moving back to a full return of five-day in-person instruction in the fall with all the pre-pandemic athletics and activities that we, we've always uh, taken a lot of pride in here at FM. Uh, we are also looking to maintain all existing programs uh, for our students. The second bullet is that new debt uh, from recently completed or ongoing building projects uh, is increasing the overall budget and we'll get into more detail what that means. Uh, but it is a significant increase uh, in our budget is related directly to the new debt that we are taking on. Uh, we are also seeing some expenditure increases in other areas such as health insurance retirement system costs, which are mandated by New York State, and contractual salary increases. The resulting budget from ongoing operations is a 3.7% increase, and with the addition of the new debt, the budget increase is 5.8%. However, uh, we're looking at a tax levy increase uh, currently at 1.1%. So once again, while the budget is increasing 5.8%, we're looking only for a tax of the increase of 1.1%. So on the revenue side of the budget, uh, we, you know, the budget was passed a little bit late this year. Uh, we got it about a week late. Um, but the, the good news is that it significantly increased foundation aid for the FM school district. A foundation aid is really the lifeblood of any uh, school district. It's the main operating aid that we receive and the most significant in terms of dollar impact. Uh, the district's tax levy increase is currently at the limit as established under law, and we'll talk about how that limit is calculated in the slide or two. And all of the revenue sources have been reviewed and adjusted in order to reflect uh, the revenues we feel comfortable that we're gonna be receiving while still maintaining a conservative approach. So this next slide is a state aid comparison, and this is a budget to budget comparison. And you can see on the top line, foundation aid, a $1.6 million increase. That is very welcome news uh, in, in a couple of different regards. You know, first and foremost, the last two years, our foundation aid has been frozen. And once again, the governor's executive budget uh, wanted to freeze foundation aid for a third year in a row. Uh, the legislature saw fit to uh, increase our aid by 1.6 million, uh, which represented a, a fairly significant increase and uh, is committed to increasing foundation aid over the next two years to our full uh, allotment, uh, which would be great news for the FM district and districts across the state. The second line is BOCES aid, and we're seeing a significant increase in that area as well. Uh, this is uh, almost exclusively due to the uh, amount of uh, instructional technology or uh, equipment that we had to purchase because of going remote this year. Uh, we purchased Chromebooks basically for all students K-12. Uh, well, I shouldn't say K-12, we did purchase iPads at the lower grade levels. But we ran those purchases through BOCES with the intent of generating BOCES aid. And you can see that we are going to be receiving an additional $477,000 in BOCES aid this next year. We skip down a few lines, you'll see building aid. And as I mentioned before, our we have new debt coming on from uh, building projects that were recently completed or currently ongoing at Wellwood. Well, that debt isn't just uh, on the taxpayer. We do receive, as I mentioned before, uh, a significant portion uh, back in terms of building aid uh, we're about 80%, and you can see even though our debt went up by 1.8 million, our building aid is going up by 1.6 million. The CARES Act was money that was originally passed uh, about a year ago, 
And we never saw any of that uh, in the current school year. Uh, we are budgeting to receive that next year, but there is still a possibility we might receive it before June 30th of this year. But we did budget for it in the next year. The last line was a pandemic adjustment, which if you go back a year ago, uh, New York State and, and the governor said that they were going to reduce our budget by the amount of money we received in the CARES Act. So 170,000 of the 670 was directly related to the CARES Act that we were gonna be receiving. Uh, in addition, uh, the governor had said that we might, they might need to reduce our aid by 20%. So we added a, a $500,000 uh, cushion, if you will, in as a pandemic adjustment, just in case the state did in fact reduce our aid during the school year. Uh, but since those two items are now, uh, there is no pandemic adjustment in the current year. And since we're gonna be receiving the CARES Act money finally, uh, those are actually helping our budget in the 2020, in the 21-22 school year. So overall, we're receiving 4.2 million, which is a, you know, a hefty increase um, in state aid. I don't know if we've received that level of increase in the recent past. So as for the tax levy limit, uh, this once again is a multiple step calculation and it's based primarily on three factors that affect uh, the FM school district. First is inflation factor, which is measured by the consumer price index. Uh, that was a fairly low 1.23% uh, in this past year. Uh, we also get a, a growth factor and this is true brick and mortar growth in our district, new construction. Uh, which we received a, a half percent on. And then last but not least, we get a, an adjustment, uh, what's called the capital exclusion. And this is really the difference between the uh, amount of debt we have and the state aid that we're gonna receive. Uh, that difference is called the local share. And then they compare the local share from the prior year to the local share in the next year. And in our case, uh, we're actually seeing a decrease in that local share. And uh, that is actually helping to reduce the tax levy limit. So if you add up those three percentages that are in bold, you'll find that the total tax levy limit for our next year is 1.1%. And that's a resulting tax levy of a little bit more than $66 million or an increase of $731,000 over the current year. I think it's important to draw a distinction between the tax levy and the tax rate. The tax levy is the total amount of money that we collect as a district throughout from all the taxpayers within the district. The tax rate is what is actually paid uh, by individual taxpayers. And if you look at the last three years, our tax levy increase has ranged from a 2.9% to a 3.7%. But when you take into account the growth in the tax base, uh, the growth in the assessments, you can see that the tax rate increase was actually a decrease in those three years uh, or a slight decrease. Now there is one town, the town of Pompey, that does not reassess every year and their equalization rate continues to, to decline. And as that happens, their tax rate increase is different from the rest of the district. But the overall tax rate decrease um, or tax rate has decreased over the last three years. So right now uh, with a uh, tax levy increase of 1.1%, we are conservatively estimating that the tax rate will remain unchanged for next year. So unless uh, assessed values increase or exemptions are no longer there for individual taxpayers, we are looking at uh, no, no change in the tax rate for this next year. As for all other revenues, you know, once again, uh, we are very conservative in how we budget those. Uh, we'll get to the list, but it is really a laundry list of different areas that we do receive a uh, relatively small amount of revenue in, but you'll see that in the next page. And uh, once again, um, we kind of look at the trend of what we've received over the last few years. And this year being a bit unusual, uh, we've kind of discounted 
you know, what our receipts are in this year, because uh, in many regards, they were a lot less than what we normally would see. So these are all the all other revenue categories on your left-hand side. Uh, there's just a couple that I wanted to highlight. Uh, one is the second item, which is interest income, which is declining by a significant portion because interest rates are have really, uh, you know, dropped dramatically. Uh, the other line that I wanted to highlight is the donation line. Um, the district was able to enter into agreements with a solar uh, company that is installing two different solar farms, one over in North Eagle Village and one near Green Lake State Park. Uh, they offered the district uh, almost $327,000 as a one-time donation uh, to the district that would, can be used uh, towards uh, STEM programming within the district, and we're looking at uh, utilizing it in that way. Um, you know, when we, re, when we were in negotiations, we thought that this might be a tough budget year, and we felt that the uh, $327,000 would be uh, very much needed. So this next slide, you know, kind of puts all the revenue together, and uh, you can see that we uh, show the revenue several different ways uh, in different graphs. Uh, we show it numerically, and you can see that you know state aid makes up 26% of our overall revenues, while the tax levy uh, is at 71%. However, if you look at this chart down below, this revenue trend, you can see that um, over time. Uh, state aid has tended to decline. And we got to um, last year where it was about, uh, it was about 23% of our total revenue was state aid. Um, at the same time, the tax levy kind of mirrors it or is an inverse relationship to the amount of state aid we received. And we were up over 74% of our revenue came from the tax levy. With this increase, and you can see how the line now has changed on the state aid side, how we've increased uh, by $1.6 million foundation aid, uh, we've gone from uh, you know, basically a little under 23% to up to 26% of our uh, revenue is from state aid. And at the same time, we dropped the tax levies from 74% to 71%. And we are encouraged that this trend will continue if the state keeps with its commitment to fully fund the foundation aid formula over the next two years. So this is truly good news and, and really a long time coming. Uh, foundation aid formula has been in practice for about 10 years. It was never fully funded. Um, and you know, at least in our case, we were probably at the height over $5 million behind on what we should have been receiving on an annual basis. So this is truly good news. So now we'll turn our attention to the expenditure side of the budget. Uh, first and foremost is we do include funding each and every year to support the district's strategic plan and the different initiatives we have from year to year. Uh, staffing is expected to be relatively the same as in the current year. Uh, additional resources have been included to further support uh, academics related to, or uh, support our students related to academics, health and safety. And we are still seeing, um, you know, some cost increases, as I mentioned before, with regard to the health insurance and retirement system. Um, we did have to increase our budget on instructional technology. Uh, we basically spent uh, our entire budget, you know, basically on Chromebooks this past year, uh, which put us a little bit behind in our normal replacement plan for other uh, equipment that we use uh, throughout the district, uh, specifically uh, smart boards and, and laptops for teachers. So we're looking at increasing the budget this next year to help catch us up on uh, that replacement plan. And as I mentioned before, the new debt um, is really, you know, one of the main drivers of the expenditure side of the budget. So when we look specifically at uh, our fringe benefits side, you know, as I mentioned before, health insurance premiums are increasing. We're seeing a 5% increase and we're hopeful that that will continue to trend lower than it has the last couple of years. I know we were up around 8% for a year or two 
and we're hopeful that uh, we'll keep be able to keep those increases at about 5%. Uh, we are looking at the good news that uh, dental and vision premiums will see no change year to year. And the other good news is that workers' compensation premiums are expected to go down by 8%. These next two bullets have to do with our retirement system costs. The uh, TRS is the teacher's retirement system, which covers teachers, teaching assistants, and administrators. Uh, we're looking at an employer contribution percentage uh, increasing from five or 9.53% to 9.8. It's about 2.8% increase overall, which is fairly nominal. Uh, the employee retirement system, which covers all other district employees, um, that is a little bit more substantial. You know, we're moving from 14.6% of salaries to 16.2. That's about an 11% increase. So before I get into the debt payments, you'll see pictures here of the, uh, the beautiful new addition at Wellwood. On the left-hand side, we uh, see the new art rooms, uh, very well lit, a lot of window, a lot of outside light coming in. Uh, the middle picture is the new cafeteria, which is great to get that out of the basement and get that up. And once again, very well lit. Um, it was a little bit of an overcast day outside, but a lot of windows and uh, a lot of outside light coming in as well. And then the right hand side shows one of the rooms, our uh, strings room, that's part of the new music suite at Wellwood. So beautiful new additions. Um, we are looking at debt expense. Uh, increasing by 1.8 million. And once again, that's really, uh, most of that is related to the funding of, or the continuation of financing the Wellwood construction project. But at the same time, as I mentioned before, we're getting, you know, $1.6 million back in building aid. So the net local share is a little bit more than $200,000 this next year. So we like to look at expenditures in what's called the three part format, which is instruction, administration, and capital. Uh, this is the first of two slides related to instructional program. And this really relates to, you know, K-12 instruction. Um, you know, uh, since uh, school districts are what I would call very labor intensive in terms of, you know, probably three quarters of our cost is really salary and benefits. It comes as no surprise that the single most uh, or the largest increase on this slide would be instructional salaries. Uh, you can also see that uh, the overall increase in the K-12 instruction area is $700,000. And remember that number, $700,000. So when we get to the next slide, uh, which is the, re, uh, the second part of the instructional program, this is more of the support areas, you know, areas such as um, BOCES career and technical education, special education, uh, you know, summer school, instructional technology in the classroom, all the different supports that we offer our students in terms of guidance and health services, et cetera, athletics, transportation. And, you know, on here, you know, we, as I mentioned before, we were increasing the IT budget so that we can, you know, uh, get back on our replacement plan. You can see there's about $260,000 increase in that area. Uh, you can also see that we put aside quite a bit of money to help with student support uh, in this next year. And as I mentioned before, you know, that remember that number 700,000, you can see that the overall instructional program is going up almost 1.6 million. So about half of that was in K-12 education or instruction and the other half is really in those support, uh, student support areas. So I think it's a very well-balanced budget when it, comes term, uh, when it comes to the instructional program. Uh, you also notice these little percentages down at the bottom. Those just for, represent the, uh, you know, the total cost of an instructional program as a percentage of the overall budget. You can see it's actually slightly down from year to year, but that's really a function of the new debt. And you'll see when we get to the capital slide that uh, the new debt is really increasing the capital percentage, which then uh, ends up having a negative effect on the other areas. As for the administration part of the budget, um, you can see that the overall uh, percentage is once again slightly down. Uh, we're increasing the overall administrative budget by 237,000. 
the lion's share of that is really in the area of curriculum development and supervision. Uh, we put quite a bit of money um, into the uh, curriculum development area, uh, primarily because there's a lot of areas that New York State is coming out with where we have to uh, go back and, and uh, you know, review our curriculum in uh, several different content areas. We also put money into this area for uh, the, the uh, specific uh, purpose of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So uh, we did uh, support that effort uh, here in the budget as well. This next slide represents the capital portion and the capital portion is really our operations and maintenance, which is, you know, uh, employees such as custodians and maintenance employees, groundskeepers, but it also includes all our utilities, everything that's really facilities uh, related, uh, all our maintenance projects, our maintenance costs, our supplies. We've seen some significant increases in um, the amount of money we spend on filters, uh, whether it's the uh, MERV 13 filters for our normal uh, ventilation systems or the uh, uh, HEPA filters that we're using in the air purifiers that are you know, basically in every area uh, every room throughout the district. Uh, you can then see that the bottom portion is really our, our debt. Um, and the one thing I wanted to note here or highlight is the uh, capital bond anticipation notes. Our overall debt's going up 1.8 million. 1.7 million of that is directly related to helping finance the uh, Wellwood project. And you can see the percentages down here at the bottom because there is such an increase in debt it really skews the percentages here from year to year. The one item uh, back on this slide that I also wanted to, you know, do a little bit deeper uh, dive on is the uh, transfer to capital. Uh, transfer to capital is really a budgetary appropriation where we take money and set that aside each year to fund limited scope capital projects. Uh, in the current year, um, if you go back a year, we voted on $450,000, and that was intended to um, repave as much of Pride Lane as we could and begin the carpet replacement with tile at Enders Road. Um, the number, when we went out to bid, the numbers came in very favorably on the paving, which allowed us to do a majority of the repaving of Pride Lane, which is going to start in May. Um, we were able to do uh, two pods uh, this summer at Enders Road, but because the numbers came in so favorable on the paving, this 450000 for next year will be to uh, repave the remainder of Pride Lane, uh, which will amount to about $150,000, and utilize the remaining $300,000 to replace, uh, as I said here, a significant amount of the carpeting. We're fingers crossed that if the numbers came in as they did this year, that we will be able to replace the carpeting in the remaining six pods. So the hope is if we get good numbers on bid day, we'll be able to finish off the rest of the carpet replacement at Enders Road, which is really good news. So the last uh, piece of the expenditure budget that we wanted to review is the uh, employee benefit side uh, we break this out to give it uh, visibility because it is a significant portion of our budget. Overall, it's 27, 28% of our overall budget. Uh, you can see that the single largest increase is in the line of health, dental, and vision, uh, which accounts to about $838,000 of the increase, um, which is a significant portion. Um, when we total all the different parts of the budget, you can see that the grand total budget uh, is an increase of $5 million, uh, which represents once again a 5.8% in, in, uh, increase. But that being said, I think that, you know, with the tax levy only going up 1.1%, it's a very reasonable budget. So this is a summary of the expenditures and uh, we did break out the capital projects and, you know, what the debt is. And this is simply to highlight uh, these percentages on the right-hand side our percentages of that increase, that change, compared to the total budget for last year. So you can see of the 5.8% increase overall, 
a little almost 2.1 percent of that is related to the new debt so from ongoing operations the increase is 3.7 percent and the majority of that increase is really in the program area which is really where we want the increase to be so to summarize uh, once again this budget is based upon a full return to five-day instruction uh, that was our intent from the beginning and, and we built the budget around that around that assumption uh, there are currently no plans to make any reductions to any of the educational programs that we have uh, taking such pride in, in bringing to our students and school community. We are looking at, you know, certain expenditure increases. Um, and as I mentioned before, you know, you have salary increases and health insurance cost increases, mandated increases in retirement system costs. But the single biggest item is really the new debt from the, the uh, building projects that we, we uh, are either in the progress of finishing off or finished off last year with regard to the high school and Enders Road. And while the tax levy increase is a fairly um, low 1.1%, we feel very comfortable that the tax rate will remain unchanged this next year. There will be a second proposition, um, basically to uh, purchase or uh, give the district the ability to purchase and borrow money to uh, purchase five school buses. These will be replacement school buses. And, uh, you know, this slide pretty much, you know, outlines the cost, not only the total cost of that purchase, but also the annual cost. We do receive 73% back in state aid um, on our purchase. Uh, once again, since we borrow the funds here, that 73% covers both principal and interest. Uh, this does not, will not have a budgetary impact on next year's budget because of the timing of when we borrow the money and when we receive the buses, the first payment on those buses won't be until the following school year, the meaning the 22-23 school year. So uh, this picture on the right is our beautiful new library media center at the high school. And um, so this first bullet is today. You know, it's really the budget presentation of the proposed budget for next year and the adoption hopefully this evening. Uh, by uh, state regulation, uh, this, the budget would need to be adopted no later than this Friday. So hopefully it'll be tonight. Uh, we are also mandated to have a budget hearing seven to 14 days prior to the budget vote. And we've scheduled that budget hearing for the same night as our board meeting in May, which is May 10th. Uh, the budget vote uh, this year will be the third Tuesday in May. Uh, it's nice to be back into May and not having to vote in June. And I'm sure District Clerk will, will uh, second the opinion that uh, it would be great not to have to send out absentee ballots to uh, a large number of people. So once again, our budget vote will be May 18th. Uh, we are planning on having that as we have in the past at FAL. Um, and with that, are there any questions? I don't have any questions, but I did want to say thank you very much, Bill. Um, you, you and your whole staff do a tremendous job putting this budget together. Uh, we are some very, um, very tough moments this year, very, but it's worked out wonderfully. And thank you so much for your leadership. We do appreciate it. Well, thank you. And it, it really is a team effort. I know we, we start budget development very early. Uh, we talk a lot about it uh, at the district office uh, team level, um, you know, getting input from, from Jeff and Mary and Lisa and Craig and uh, so that starts very early on. There's a lot of work that goes on in the background by the staff here in the business office and, you know, primarily Lynn Fry and, and Cheryl Connolly and Tracy, Tracy Noble. Uh, they all do a great job and all, you know, uh, submit quite a bit of information that goes into this budget development process. So thank you. Other questions, comments from the board? I know we've seen it a bit 
several times, but I, just, I just want to say I'm happy with that good news about the foundation aid. Anyone else? Okay, thank you very much, Bill. Next on the agenda, 2.03. Thank you, Daryl. Um, item 2.03, the President's Report. So we are meeting online today. Uh, we talked about, obviously, we talked about meeting in person in our last board meeting but we wanted to be respectful of the fact that there was a lot going on in our schools today as we welcomed back more students. So um, that was the reason why we kept our meeting online. Um, Sarah has prepared, um, has done some work into how we could come back and have an in-person meeting. So I'd like to um, talk about that at this point again, to see if the board uh, would like to move forward with an uh, in-person meeting for May or June, uh, depending on what you all are interested in doing. So the idea is to have the meeting at the high school room 1209, uh, Taos 1 on the second floor. We would enter through the auditorium lobby. Um, it is handicap accessible. We would be seated at table six feet apart. Assistant superintendents and the clerk would be um, in the terrace seating. There would be seating for up to 15 members of the public. We would allow in-person public comment with pre-registration online. And we would have our presentations done from the podium. So the meeting would be live streamed uh, directly to YouTube. Um, there would be a wide angle shot of the board. We would switch to Chromebooks, which will make things a little easier for us. And we would have microphones that are connected to the live stream to allow for clear audio quality for um, the public. Sarah, did I miss anything? The only thing I would add is that the governor's emergency powers that allow him to suspend the open meetings law currently expire on April 30th. And the open meetings law suspension currently ends on May 6th. So we may have no choice in other words. That is correct. Okay. All right, thoughts from the board about um, in person for our next board meeting. It sounds like we have to plan for it. <laughs> yeah. I I'm doubt they're going to extend it. it. Aren't you all just tired of these squares? <laughs> I'm tired of these squares. What did you say, Mark? I said I'm all for it. Yeah. It's Let's just, press forward. If we expect our kids back in school, along with the teachers and everybody else, I think we should be there as well. Mm -hmm. Well, having been the one who wasn't too into it last time, I don't know that I'm that much more into it. However, <laughs> I think if the state is going to, you know, is not going to renew that, I think that we have to, because I would hate for us to not, and then have Sarah and everybody have to scramble you know, um, for six days or 10 days to get us into the meeting. So I'm, I'm fine if we want to meet in person on May. So Sarah did mention that we're going to be using Chromebooks now. So we're going to need in order to uh, make sure that everyone can log in very quickly for the meeting. I believe Sarah needs board members to stop in between now and before the next board meeting, Sarah. Yeah, to... If you can give me a couple of days, I will okay. certainly email the board, but I would like each board member to stop up to the district office to attempt the login on our district IP addresses to make sure that things go as smoothly as possible at our next regular meeting. Okay, that sounds great. Any other questions, comments from the board? Well, I'm so I'm just... Jason? I'm sorry, so just to clarify, so for folks that wanna speak at public comment, they will have to physically come to the room. They will not be able to do it via remotely as they have been in the past, is that correct? Yeah, mm -hmm. that is correct. Okay. But we still will live stream it, so if they wanna watch it from home, they can still do that. Yes. Okay, great. I look forward to seeing everybody in person next month. <laughs> so nice. <laughs> we okay. masks on though. Yes, yes, we have to follow COVID protocol, so with our masks on, but it's still in person, so we're getting there. <laughs> we're getting there. All right, if there's no further conversation or comments on that, I will move on 
to item 2.05, the superintendent's report, COVID update. I'm sorry, nope, superintendent's report, regular superintendent's report. Sorry no, about that. I think everybody's heard enough of me tonight, so I can combine the, the next two here. Uh, let me walk you through. There's uh, an outline uh, in your uh, administrative content under superintendent's report, internal operations. As you are aware, we have not utilized our last two emergency closing days. Uh, while we do not have to return these days to any unionized group in accordance with our collective bargaining agreements, the Board of Education has the authority to weigh in on any changes to the school calendar for this year. So I would like to bring it to your attention now in the event that you would like to take action by our May 10th meeting and we could elect to return the days. We don't have to return the days uh, going forward, but I'm sure if we're going to do something for Memorial Day or for Juneteenth at the end of June, we probably should get it on the books as soon as possible. Under community relations, as mentioned before, Onondaga County has graciously agreed to provide an on-site vaccination clinic in the near future. Last week, Baldwinsville had the first clinic, and it's my understanding that Liverpool and ESM will soon follow along with regional clinics for Southern Hills, uh, Tully, uh, Fabius, uh, Lafayette, and Onondaga, and for Jamesville DeWitt, which will also cover CBA and MPH. Hopefully we will soon uh, be there soon thereafter. Under administration, our administrators have been busy preparing for the merger of the hybrid cohorts. In addition, they've been working with our teacher leaders and faculty regarding the changes to the physical distancing and face covering requirements that have been promulgated by uh, the revised guidance from both the Onondaga County Health Department that was amended on March 16th, as well as the New York State uh, Department of Health, which was released on April 9th. They have looked at the capacity of our venues for the upcoming musical performances uh, so that we're able to include guests and this will help to celebrate the hard work of our students and their teachers in a little way, uh, hopefully bring some closure to the members of our graduating senior class uh, for one final performance. Under non-instructional business operations, our food service department will be switching to picnic friendly menu options for the K-4 levels in order in the near future in order to facilitate an outdoor dining uh, option uh, in order to stay six feet apart in the event of inclement weather as i mentioned earlier the k4 level uh, will use three feet of physical distancing along uh, with the polycarbonate barriers that were purchased by onondaga county under personnel our personnel department under the direction of mr jeff gordon has been busy during this hiring season uh, this uh, has included hiring a group of veteran teachers to work with our remote cohort of students at the elementary level. In fact, uh, Mr. Gordon's also been working on a few uh, that are hot off the press today so that there are uh, some new additions to personnel so that our new hires may give notice to their current employers as soon as possible. Under the area of students, as mentioned before, one change that families will see is that they have the responsibility for the thermal scans. Uh, beginning today. So families will be required to administer the daily temperature screenings and to answer the requisite COVID symptom questionnaire at home on the weekends. And then last but not least, under instruction, I will ask you to take action on our faculty and administrative tenure appointments this evening. These individuals have passed muster with the administration in accordance with the APPR requirements set forth by the New York State Education Department. Uh, while you award tenure this evening, the faculty member does not officially earn the tenure until the start of the new school year in September, as Mr. Gordon has reminded us before. But uh, to that end, we will take time to celebrate their accomplishments in the not too distant future. That ends my report for this evening. Thank you, Dr. Tite. So the first item that you had on there about the, um, the days that are available, I don't know about everybody else, but I, I can't think of a year when it would be nicer for everyone to have a longer Memorial Day weekend. So that would be like the Friday before and the Tuesday after? It could be, yes. Uh, we can take a look at that. I know uh, when I've talked in the past, uh, even though Juneteenth is something that people would like to consider, they know there's Regents exam weeks and exams coming up at the end. Uh, next year, we will celebrate Juneteenth, as you know, when a state holiday falls on a 
uh, Sunday, uh, it floats to the Monday. In this particular year, when a state holiday falls on a Saturday, it stays on a Saturday. Well, well let's just get to this low hanging fruit here of this extended Memorial Day holiday. Do you need, are you looking for the board's input into that? Or are, is that something you're moving towards? What, what are you looking for from us? I'm, I'm floating the idea now. I would like to make a decision and I'll make a recommendation at the May 10th meeting. So I just, this is the first that some board members have heard about it. We've been talking about it internally, uh, especially at the district office team and uh, administrative cabinet. And certainly the teachers union, uh, as you mentioned, has worked very hard this year. And so uh, it might be something we, would consider doing. Watch the weather forecast Wednesday night. Just I to know. Make sure, please. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> the weather, he's predicting snow. There's That's snow downer. predicted this week, yes. Oh, now, Jeff, we were all so happy for a moment there. <laughs> That's that's why I'm waiting until May 10th. We've had snow, as you know, as late as Mother's Day, so. Yes, well. I don't want to count my chickens before they hatch. Let's see what it looks like here. Absent a snow day, I think it's a great idea. What does everyone else think? Lucy, I what do you think it's the best say? idea ever. <laughs> it's necessary, Dr. Tice. I think you should give us that Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday off also. Now let's not get ahead of ourselves. <laughs> I know they lo don't let you vote on things, Lucy, but I appreciate you taking the initiative on this one. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Well, Other thanks for the heads. Just thanks for the heads up, Craig, and we'll just wait for your recommendation, I guess, for the May meeting. Yeah, yep. I just did if not want to surprise. Cons, right? What's that? I didn't want to surprise. there aren't any cons, so we're all in. Yeah, I just didn't want to surprise everybody on the 10th. So I just thought I would foreshadow it tonight. Thank you. Craig, I just have a different calendar question. Um, the, the one date that's not on the calendar that in all prior years other than last spring, well, it was, and then it was taken off um, is obviously graduation. And you know, I don't, I don't know that there are plans yet and I wouldn't necessarily expect, but, but I guess my question is, is there a time frame within which our senior families can expect that decision to be made? So, you know, they're 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 running into some issues where you know all college visitations and everything were virtual and campuses were shut down, and now schools are scheduling admitted student orientation weeks late June, and and a lot of our students are in a, a bit of a pickle of can they register for one? Can they take it? Or is that going to they going to miss graduation because nobody knows when that is? So, is is there any information you can share, or at least a timeline of by when decisions might be made? I would like to uh, make all the decisions by May tenth, if at all possible, not just to plan for Memorial Day accordingly, but also for commencement. Thank you, because that's just that's obviously putting a number of students in, in a bit of a bind with those decisions. Thank you. Right now, as you know, given the guidance for particular venues, indoors, outdoors, we're considering all options at this point. Well, it was very unfortunate, the decision that was made today, that, that we're increasing indoor capacity so we can, as the governor said, so that basketball playoffs can continue at the NBA level, but we're not focusing on allowing things at this level. So that's, that's very frustrating guidance coming out of the state. It seems misplaced to me. Greg, do you have an update based on what Dan just said and what we heard last week in the news about the, uh, the guidance for graduation or the, uh, the mandates for graduation attendance? Our superintendents and our uh, is there advocacy going on or is this something people are just accepting as a? No, there's advocacy going on and high school principals are looking at alternative options uh, out there. Right now, believe it or not, we have the SRC arena uh, reserved, but it would be very difficult to accommodate everybody there. Uh, right now we have it reserved for the 17th and 18th, not knowing how Juneteenth was going to fall out at the state level. So. We've, uh, I give credit to the high school administration. We've tried to cover all our bases and hopefully more information will be forthcoming so that our families can make plans accordingly. 
but we are, to your question, doing the advocacy and looking at all possibilities. Any other questions for Dr. Tice? Okay, item 2.06, committee and uh, representative updates. Um, I think we're good with these um, because we've had a quite a, the budget report to audit community relations facilities. Uh, we've had a lot of facilities, unless there was something, Dan, you wanted to add? I, I think we're gonna pass on facilities. Other than there's just one other item later on today's agenda, which is a, a, a traffic study that's being done in conjunction with the, some of the site planning for the, for the high school project. Okay, finance, Mark, you all set? Yeah, other than another thank you to Bill and his staff for an excellent job, but uh, nothing additional to add at this time. All right, Elena, policy? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the minutes were, were quite clear, um, you know, just for clarity under the revisions under 1A and B um, for 7280 standardized testing. Um, Dr. Coughlin was kind enough to walk us through all that and a lot of the information in the policy that existed that we did have was was outdated. So this was really in an effort to bring us up to date and in line with um, what is our current practice and the tests that are actually um, administered when they are administered. And then um, some of the revisions that were incorporated into our religious expression policy 8360 were taken from some of the policies um, from our tri-state schools that um, our administrators had seen and incorporated into our policy. But other than that, unless anyone has any questions on the minutes that were provided, that's all I have for you. And the administration is, excuse me, still um, reviewing and looking at our DEA sample policy from NISBA. Again, it's quite lengthy and we really did wanna make sure that they had the appropriate amount of time necessary to go through that, to make sure that the philosophical statements that are incorporated into that policy are those same statements that we want to continue having moving forward or whether or not we would revise those in any way. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Education Foundation, Sherry? There was a meeting, I have to look back at what date it was, um, but really quickly, they just uh, discussed a couple grants that were given. They will be doing the senior signs this year. Um, and they are still looking for members to take over either as part of the board or just as part of the general FMEF body. Okay. Um, and I don't, we do not have a legislative liaison report this evening. Lucy, do you have a report for us tonight? I do. So I had a few questions about the large gatherings at the end of the year, like the awards night, um, athletic banquet. I know DM was just changed, but that's also what my notes. Like now that we're allowed to be fully in school in person, I, um, what are the ideas for like the end of year gatherings? If they're going to be remote, if they're not going to be remote. And also I've had a few people ask me if Wednesdays are going to be different than they usually have been now that we've been in school. Um, full time. And then there were a few questions about live broadcasting of athletic events. Now that they're all outside, how are people going to, is there going to be live broadcasting and how would it be accessed? And then the same thing with sporting events. Um, are spec like well, Now that everything's outside again, are more spectators allowed? And then I also had a few questions about the musical where you can access the tickets. And then lastly, everyone's super excited to come back. It was like the best day ever today. And a bunch of people are looking forward to graduation, prom, ball, everything. Once New York State keep keeping us updated, we'll be good to make a few plans and ready to go. And that is all I have, actually. So, Thank you, Lucy. Um, Dr. Tice, are there, are there any of those questions that we can get to tonight? Or do we, or I know some we'll probably need to get back to Lucy about, but are there any that you, you or anyone can address this evening? Well, certainly large gatherings were getting ready to pounce, uh, you know, as the guidance changes, we certainly want to get back to some uh, semblance of normalcy. So I give uh, the student activity office and the high school administration a lot of credit to be able to be nimble and move quickly on that. 
as far as Wednesdays, I will bring that conversation up with the administrative team. I know the teachers are busy pushing for AP exams and Regents exams at the end of the year. And I know they're just excited to have everybody back in class, especially at the upper level. So what Wednesdays will morph into, I don't wanna speak for them or micromanage, but I know certainly time is precious and having everybody back together, as you indicated, is very important to them. So Wednesdays may change, they may be a little similar, but I do know that everybody's uh, ready for the last push uh, for the school year. Sporting events outside, obviously, as you know, it, we're dependent on uh, having cable, electric, uh, I, wireless is intermittent uh, sometimes, so we're often better with the indoor venues such as the gymnasiums or the stadium that already has the wiring. Uh, I know that's something the athletic department is looking into, but it's going to be, I think, very difficult. You're right on some remote fields in order to be able to pull that off, but we certainly, uh, it'll be dependent, I think, on the technological infrastructure. And yes, uh, the musical, everybody's excited. I know they've been practicing and pushing and to try to get it in before the AP exam start. It's scheduled for the end of this month. I know uh, that uh, the tickets uh, announcement is being released and trying to get people in again, physically distanced appropriate. I think everybody's excited about the cabaret style uh, performance this year and uh, just uh, to get everybody back together. So uh, yeah, we're gonna try to do multiple performances to uh, maybe uh, change it up a little bit to try to uh, use our facilities in a smart way to get as many people in as possible over a longer period of time. So I give our music department a lot of credit and the faculty uh, for trying to work out the details. Uh, I know they were chopping at the bit early to try to get things organized when we were kind of tiptoeing around and being coy about it uh, because we don't want to get people's hopes up, but uh, they've really done an outstanding job uh, pulling this all together. And I just know from the communications I've received, people are, are pretty happy and psyched about it. So I can't wait to see it. And uh, that'll be coming up here at the end of the month. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you very much. Um, next on the agenda, item 3.01, approval of minutes from March 22nd. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the regular meeting held on March 22nd? Thank you, Rebecca, second from Sherry. Any discussion of those minutes? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye, anyone opposed or abstaining? Item 3.02, <clears throat> is there a motion at the Board of Education of Fable Manly Central School District approve the minutes of the special meeting held on April 5th? There are motion. Thank you, Kelly. Second from Jason. Any discussion? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? All right. Item 3.03, .03, adoption of the 2021, uh, I think it should be 22 budget. There's a little typo there, but that's in the, okay. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District hereby adopts the 2021-22 budget as presented on April 19th, 2021? Is there a motion? Thank you, Mark. Second from Jason. Discussion. All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? I am 3.04. Adoption of the 2021-22 property tax report card. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Essential School District hereby adopts the 2021-22 property tax report card as presented on April 19th, 2021? Thank you, Mark. And a second from Dan. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Item 3.05, is there a motion that the Fayetteville Manly, I'm sorry, the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly School District approve the following personnel actions as recommended by the superintendent? Thank you, Dan. Second from Daryl. All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? 
Item 3.06, resolution OCMBOC's administrative budget. Is there a motion that it be resolved the Fable Manly Board of Education adopts the 2021-22 OCMBOC's administrative budget as presented in the amount of $8,938,696. Thank you, Sherry. Second from Mark, any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand, indicate aye. Aye, anyone opposed or abstaining? All right, item 3.07. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Sable Manlius Board of Education agrees to cast its vote in the annual election of members of the Board of Cooperative Education Services for the person or persons indicated on the ballot? Is there a motion? Thank you, Daryl. Second from Kelly. Discussion. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Separately. I'm sorry, what? Separately. Which, what would you like separately, Elena? Each nominee. Okay, so I think I need to. Uh, so you're motioning to separate the ballots. Do I need a motion to do that in a second or do I, I don't, I'm sorry. Wasn't expecting that. So I do need a motion, Sarah. The, the board has the ability to cast up to four votes total, one per candidate. So it could be broken up into e a motion for each candidate. All right, so is there a motion to cast a vote in the annual election of members of the Board of Cooperative Education Services for Wayne Bronson, um, resident of East Syracuse, Manoa. Thank you, Daryl. Is there a second? Thank you, Elena. Any discussion? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstain? Is there a motion to cast a... Uh, is there a motion to cast a vote in the annual election of members of the Board of Education, Board of Cooperative Educational Services for Marissa Mims, resident of Fable Manly Central School District? Thank you, Kelly. Is there a second? Thank you, Mark. Discussion. All those in favor, please raise your hand, indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Two, Dan and Elena, or abstaining? Thank you. Next, is there a motion that the Fable Manlius Board of Education agrees to cast its vote in the annual election of members of the Board of Cooperative Education Services for Luke Moranis of the Homer Central School District? Thank you, Elena, and a second from Mark. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstain? And lastly, is there a motion that the Fable Manlius Board of Education agrees to cast his vote in the annual election of members of the Board of Cooperative Education Services for Sean Rayburn of the Lafayette Central School District. Thank you, Rebecca. Second from Daryl. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? All right. Next on the agenda item. Marissa, three. Yes. Just, you know, I know I did send on March 8th an email to you and the board and Craig, so I would still like to circle back at some point because I would still like some sort of memo from the BOCES board of directors on all the items that I listed. However, until we decide as a, as a group, um, I understand that nothing will be done. Okay. So um, we can either discuss it now or we can, you know, finish um, going through details on that. Um, via email. Would you like to, do you have anything you'd like to say right now or anyone else? Well, my points are still valid. And, and again, it, I just want to be ensured that um, BOCES, you know, as wonderful of an organization as they are and what great work they do for all our component districts, um, year in and year out that there's a clear understanding that um, we were not properly informed of the pr process. And even in your email to us, Marissa, and I quote, um, it says the OCM BOCES board would like the seat filled in time for their December meeting. This was for the temporary nominee, as we were told, the board's interested in either Daryl or myself filling the seat for the remainder of the term, 
which would end June 30th, 2021. In May, the board would need to nominate someone who lives in FM, not necessarily a board member for a th three year term. And in reality, um, you know, we were told that if we didn't continue with the person that we nominated, that the seat would go back to JD. We were never informed of that early on in the process. And, um, you know, we don't even know whether it was the BOCES board or their bylaws that required us to make the nomination in November because the impression that was left with us was that we had to make that nomination in November and that we would be able to nominate somebody else for this vote that we just um, did in April. So just for clarity and for moving forward, I think it's important for boards to understand what the process is. Any other thoughts or comments at this time? I was the one that did the informing. Early on in November, it was to fill the seat that uh, was caused by the untimely death of Ann Wright, uh, the BOCES board president, as you know. So the information that I received at that time was to stop gap and until the election. I think what you're referring to, Ms. Romano, is the uh, whatever, like you said, the bylaws or whatever conversation that took place afterwards with the BOCES board themselves. But I was informed by the administration at BOCES uh, looking to stopgap the position in November. Okay, anyone else? Any other comments at this time? Okay, well, thank I, you all. I know you'll do a great job representing us, Mar Marissa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sherry. I appreciate, I appreciate that. All right, so let's move on to Item, hold on a second. 3.08, approval of policies. Is there a motion of the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manley Central School District hereby approves the following policies in second reading? 3112, district brand identity use and 3600 lost and found. Is there a motion? Thank you, Sherry. Is there a second? Thank you, Mark. Any discussion? Just real quick, there they, they are as they should be. I'm just curious, Dr. Tice, especially with the brand use policy, this is new. Is is there some plan to uh, disseminate that information? Can we do an article on it? Can we do something so at, at least all of the organizations within or attached to the district would know about this? Yes, with the board's approval tonight, we received backup information as the district clerk knows uh, from legal counsel. So I will begin with the administrative team probably Wednesday or this Wednesday or the Wednesday thereafter. And then you're right, we will roll it out to the general public, uh, whether it's through our communications department and so forth. But I wanted, I didn't want to get the cart before the horse. I wanted the board to approve, as you know, uh, but yes, uh, depending on how busy we are this week, it'll be either this week or next week, yes. Okay, it's just one of those policies that shouldn't just get quietly added into the manual. So just, Correct. okay, thank you. But even you're right, even for our local community vendors uh, where there's been partnerships with booster clubs and so forth, uh, we have the forum from legal counsel that we need to, to get out and about. I think it's been time well spent uh, with the policy committee and legal counsel. I think this will clarify a lot of areas areas and bring closure to our work to come up with a unique uh, trademark uh, going forward. Thank you. Any further discussion? All right, so we had a first and a second. All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye, anyone opposed or abstaining? All right, we're on to 3.09 policies in first reading. Is there a motion? Sorry, hold on. Oh, is there a motion that the Board of Education of the Fable Manley Central School District moves the following revised policies into second reading at the next board meeting? 7280, standardized testing program, and 8360, religious expression in the instructional program. Is there a motion? Thank you, Dan. Second from Sherry. Discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? All right. Ooh, we got a lot tonight. Um, 
10 health and welfare services contract with the Syracuse City School District. Is there a motion of the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District authorize the board president, district clerk, and superintendent to sign the contract for the health and welfare services provided by Syracuse City School District for the 2020-21 school year? Is there a motion? Thank you, Kelly. Second from Mark. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand, indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? 3.11. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District authorize the board president and district clerk to sign the contract for health and welfare services provided by Auburn and Large City School District for the 2020-21 school year? Is there a motion? Thank you, Dan. Second for Mark. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? All right. Item 3.12, approval of traffic impact assessment study. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District hereby agrees to appoint GTS Consulting to complete a traffic impact assessment at the Fayetteville Manly High School, the cost of which shall not exceed $5,750. Is there a motion? Thank you, Mark. Second from Daryl, any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Okay. Item 3.13, approval for the proposal for construction testing Pride Lane paving project. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education or the Fayetteville Manly Central School District hereby agrees to accept the proposal from CME Associates Incorporated for construction materials testing and special inspection services with a total estimated cost of $7,486. Is there a motion? Thank you, Daryl. Second from Mark. Any discussion? Just a little confused on what this is, Bill. Is this just testing asphalt? I mean, what can you just speak to this a little bit? Sure. It's um it's basically testing the base. They have to do some core samples of testing. Okay before they lay down the, the repavement of Pride Lane. And that's simply, a lot of times we run this through the architect, uh, but technically we don't have a contract in place with CME being named as a subcontractor of theirs. So we're going direct on this with CME um, and they're just gonna you know, do their test borings as we need to do before the project uh, commences. Okay, thanks. Any further discussion? And this is important uh, because with the, this project, I mean, they are digging down as uh, going to be a base binder coat, top coat, but they're also removing the speed bumps. They're putting in uh, alternatives there that, right, Mr. Furlong, that can be taken out during the winter months for plowing. Yeah, we are looking at putting in uh, speed bumps to, uh, you know, so the traffic we're also looking at uh, being able to put in some um, some signs that actually have the person's speed, and putting you know posting speed limit signs you know along Pride Lane as well. But these won't be as uh, you know the the speed bumps won't be like the uh, the current configuration, which uh, are quite large. Put it that way. And Bill, just to clarify, we weren't we're, uh, we didn't have to go out to RFP for this. We did not because it was below the limit. Okay. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? All right, item four point oh one board development. Um. Well, there was discussion a little bit earlier about the curriculum audit next year that falls in line with our DEI goals. Are there any other, and we're also waiting to hear back about the municipal policy that's being reviewed by diversity policy is being reviewed by our administrators. Um, is there anything anyone wants to discuss at this time or I feel like there's some things going on in the background right now that um, we'll be able to discuss at our next meeting. Those two things I should say, not other things, but. Anyone else have any thoughts right now on those two, on our goals? Okay. 
working agenda items. Uh, not seeing anything there. Uh, potential considerations for future meetings, nothing there. Um, oops. Future meetings calendar. All right, so we're gonna plan to be in person at our next meeting and do not forget. So in your email, you are going to see the superintendent's evaluation has come through. So um, that meeting is held to discuss it on the 18th. Um, and then let's see, dates to remember. So are we gonna have a deadline to complete that by? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I will get one. one out to you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. We definitely would have a date to get that done. Okay. Um, we just, I think it might actually already be in superintendent evaluation. The, okay. um, yes. So there's a deadline in there. Um, all right. Where am I at? Oh, okay. Consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Thank you, Daryl. Second from Rebecca. All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? All right, now I know we didn't send an email earlier, but we do have a short executive session um, for the purpose of discussing, hold on one second, let me make sure I say this right, for the purpose of discussing the um, employment of a particular corporation. Is there a motion to adjourn to executive session for the purpose of discussion of the employment of a particular corporation? Thank you, Daryl. Second from Jason, all those in favor, please raise your hand, indicate aye. Aye, anyone opposed or abstaining? All right, so that's gonna conclude the public session of our meeting. We are now gonna go in executive session. There'll be no further public uh, part of the meeting. So thank you very much to those who are watching on the live stream. We're gonna take a few second minutes to close that down and then we'll go into executive session and adjourn immediately thereafter. Thank you to our administrators for hanging with us.